Tang Ji organized this, uh, particularly permitting a proxy speaker. Uh, in fact, uh, Professor Pakiredi, an economist, would have presented. Uh, he could have given his own economics point of view. Uh, I am a practicing scientist, or at least I was, I should say. Uh, I will give the technical uh, perspective and potential of agribiotechnology as a key to prosperity. Uh, also, uh, I have been associated with the rice for more than three and a half decades, so I am a little bit biased to rice. Uh, anyway, there have been no speakers in the morning to speak of rice. Uh, let me begin with uh, these two organizations I am associated. One is ICR, IIRR, and the other is Agribiotech Foundation. Uh, let me begin with a big picture. Uh, this is the century that will determine the fate of uh, planet Earth. Uh, there is one uh, animal population which is less than 5,000 years old which is pushing the planet to the edge and this is supposed to be an intelligent animal. Uh, you can guess what it is. And you know there are three factors that have pushed the planet Earth to the edge. Number one is the population because this is the only animal which has escaped natural control of population and because of that. Uh, the population has a doubled, if you can see this, in one generation time of 40 years, the population has doubled itself. This phenomena has never occurred in the history of humankind and we are told that it will never happen again. It may look like good news, but it is not so good news because it is continuing to rise, whether it is at a high projection, medium projection or low projection. The second activity is because of the human activity, the CO2 emissions are increasing. That is changing the habitable climate on the earth. And the third is that we are squeezing the fresh water from the water resources. These three factors are contributing to most of our oats. And coming down to the, the uh, situation in India as such, uh, most of you are aware that our population is growing steadily and it is likely to reach 1.4 billion by 2025. But our food production, the total production, as of 253 million tons, now we need 300 tons, rise from 100 to 40, 140. So in the next 15 years, we have to go 40 percent more. What are the enhancing productivity challenges? Uh, it has been repeatedly told, again I repeat, shrinking arable land area, or at least it is stagnant, and certainly it is decreasing because of the several other activities that are going on on a productive land, depleting soil productivity, diminishing water for irrigation, changing climate, and also as told by the others, increasing cost of cultivation, fluctuating market and scarcity of labor. How do we meet these challenges? There are three pronged approaches. One is genetic improvement of the crop, which I will be dealing with. Again, there are improvement management, improved management both in the crop husbandry as well as in management of other resources and favorable policies. Uh, let me confine to the genetic improvement. Genetic improvement in the past has shown its potential. The traditional approach, uh, if I am permitted to put it, that two defective genes, one SD1 standing for semi dwarf and RHT reduced the height 1 in rice and wheat respectively, they brought in green revolution during 60s. The food production doubled in the two decades. Uh, they recall the picture, the population doubled in four decades and the food production doubled in two decades. And that proved the Malthusian uh, prediction that uh, the human race is going to meet doomsday has been averted. So this is the science and this is the technology that has uh, escaped us or it has rescued us and there is every reason and every um, um, uh, hope that it will do it again. So, however, the Green Revolution has led into stagnation. In the past two decades, the productivity of several major crops is plateauing. The productivity growth is declining. Biotic and abiotic stresses are on the rise. Cost of production, again and again it is told, is bringing down the net profit for, of the cultivation to the farmers. So now we are in a, a phase of from green revolution to gene revolution. So there have been several advances in molecular biology, the basic science that has led to development of biotechnologies. These biotechnologies can be classified into genetic engineering of the crops which we have been talking 
and there is another silent less uh, um, uh, publicized molecular bidding with markers. These two are very promising and they are already giving us the product. Uh, just to touch upon the advantages of agribiotechnology, uh, novel variability can be created. Uh, variability is the spice of life. That is the one that is the driving engine for productivity gain. Uh, the, the, if the limitation of variations in the primary germplasm is limited, biotechnology can bring in novel uh, variability. Genes can be transferred from any organism to any organism across the species. And selection can be very precise. And there can be rapid development of varieties. Time for development of varieties can be cut down. However, there are certain limitations of agribiotechnology. The first one is the development of technology is very cost intensive. And there are perceived threats, as we were discussing in the morning. The gene flow uh, from the, to the wild species, whatever the transgene we put in the crop varieties, are likely to go into the, the wild species. A weed can become super weed. This is one of the threats. Antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is used as a selection marker in the transformation. Uh, now the science has improved that we can even avoid this and impact on biodiversity. These are some of the threats perceived and overblown. Now come to the, the production or the what are the products of biotechnology. The first generation as it has been told, the BT, BT zinc, BT cotton, BT corn, BT canola, BT soybean, these employed a single gene conferring resistance uh, for the insects, major pests like bollworms or the corn borer, etc. And the single gene for herbicide resistance, Roundup Ready, uh, cotton, maize, etc. These single genes are very effective in controlling the weeds. This is again taken from Clyde James. Everybody can see them on the website. The total area uh, has only the herbicide tolerance is covering the cumulative area is more than 1,100 million and also the, the insect resistance, BT crops are almost touching 20 million hectares cumulatively. And the second generation products are stacked genes. Yes, now uh, uh, Tran was talking about this. This has a combination of either two BT genes or BT plus herbicide tolerance. And now in the second phase, lots of marker assisted selection products are coming out. One of the one is the Swarna sub-1 rice developed at International Rice Research Institute. Then quality maize developed at the CIMEC. And even in the India, we have improved Pusa, Basmati, and Samba Mashiri coming from uh, IIRR. These are now occupying a large area, and these are not GM products. So they do not need biosafety regulation. But a lot of things are coming up on the pipeline. Uh, now, again, the, the James uh, picture, this has been already uh, shown. A record of 18 million farmers in 28 countries. 29th is Vietnam, we said that, and 181.5 million hectares is planted to GM crops during 2014. The third generation of agribiotic products are in the pipeline, such as biofortification, there are uh, research going on in a rice, golden rice for vitamin E, enriched vitamin A, then wheat, groundnut, and low glycemic uh, uh, diabetes rice, this is also in the, in the discussion. And th drought and salinity tolerance, submergent tolerance, these products are uh, in the final stages of testing in rice and other crops. Uh, we also have uh, high temperature tolerance to add to that one, high and low temperature tolerance, which are called climate smart varieties. And then again morning it was talked about the input use efficiency. Water use efficient, higher water use efficiency, higher nitrogen use efficiency, phosphorus and zinc, etc. These are also under... Uh, uh, several stages of uh, production. Coming to the fourth generation of agribiotic products, they are on the drawing boards. One of the very big projects is biological nitrogen fixation in cereal crops. The other one is conversion of C3 to C4 photosynthesis system. This is a 15-year project funded by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, being taken up uh, at ERI in a consortium mode. Uh, and then uh, there are also ancillary uh, developments of agribiotech for ecological engineering. It is not necessarily that a crop plant need to be engineered. You can also engineer the microbes, uh, which will help in improvement, such as improvement of the strains uh, that uh, can be better biofertilizers, better biocontrol agents, and also the 
there can be the manipulation of directly the crop pests uh, by genetic engineering which are called as a recessive uh, re the sterile insects this is big now in a adaptive stage in case of malaria control through genetic engineering of mosquitoes it may come even for the crop pests uh, now coming down to what are we doing at agribiotech foundation uh, we also have the research programs uh, funded by competitive grants uh, such as uh, black gram rice for improvement through for yellow mosaic virus resistance we have rice brown plant hopper resistance through marker resistance selection we have a transgenic program of cotton with multiple genes for borer and sap sucker and also we have improvement of microbial strains for liquid biofertilizer drought tolerance of the crops we also do extension and consultancy studies at the agribiotech foundation thus agribiotech will be the key for prosperity biotech products are called as scale neutral and in adoption and it will benefit both large and marginal farmers equally thank you very much